my experience in my life has just driven me with complication after complication that I had to overcome all these hurdles in life that said, yo, it's either you drop dead and be finished with whatever you're trying to do, or you get the fuck up, pick yourself up and just do it. That's why I always tell people when they say, oh, I can't. It's not that you can't. You choose not to. I can't means I didn't fail yet because you already gave up. The only way to fail is to keep on trying until you actually cannot. My slogan, I can and I will, is to say, I'm going to keep on doing this until my body adapts to whatever the fuck I'm doing so that it does it. We're human beings. We adapt to everything. The core spirit of athleticism is to, be, is to not be afraid of pushing yourself past your mental and physical limits. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Improve Mentor. Yeah, the podcast changed name a few times. First of all, it was what? Uh, let's talk about it, then chilling with Rick. But I figured out that it's better to have a name like Improve Mentor because at the end of the day, all we talk about is how to improve yourself, self-awareness, and self-improvement. So today we have a special guest. His name is Hank Palmer. He's my personal trainer, my mentor and friend who taught me a shit ton about physical uh, conditioning. And he has one of the most fascinating life journey that I've ever seen. He was a professional athlete at the age of 17, specializing on track and field, represented Canada and competed with the best of the best of the world in Beijing Olympics in 2008. And one of the athletes he competed against is none other than Usain Bolt. He coaches McGill Varsity and he's an entrepreneur. He has his own training method and brand called Golden Phoenix. He's a man of many talents, unbreakable will and determination. So my first question to you, was there a defining moment for you that made you realize, yeah, I'm going to be an athlete? Or was it a gradual growth into something that organically developed? Well, I started um, sports at a young age, right? So I did soccer, hockey, football, et cetera, from age of five. My parents put me in sports. And then track and field uh, was just dropped on me, actually. I was seven. And my grade school teacher said, Hank, you run fast in um, all the football games. And then when we play soccer in the field. And uh, he's like, you ever try track and field? And I'm like, I don't know what that is. And when I looked it up, it looked like people were running in a circle all day and it looked boring. But uh, push come to shove, they got me to go to a track meet and I learned what it was. It was a multi-event. Uh, we did, I think it was eight events we had to compete in. And the accumulation of points, uh, you would get a medal. So um, seeing that I was used to like hockey schedules, I got there a little bit later because they said uh, it started at five. I thought, you know, you get there at five. You warm up and then, you you know, start competing like maybe an hour later. But unfortunately, I was too late. I missed two events, uh, I mean, three events. But um, with the accumulation of points that I got, I was still able to get third place overall. So then I started thinking to myself, and at the age of seven, if I got here early and I actually did all the events, maybe I would have got a gold medal. Obviously, I had a very competitive um, state of mind at that point in my life. So I went to the next meet, went there early, did all the events, and got a gold medal. And then that's when my addiction started. It's funny that you call it an addiction. Um, so is it an addiction to competition, self-improvement? What were you addicted to exactly? Self-improvement. Seeing what I can do. Seeing the, the maximum that I can push myself physically, mentally. Um, learning new things. Uh, learning new abilities. For instance, I started with uh, sprints, right? Then I started a little bit with high jump. Then learn hurdles and then learn long jump. When I learned all these events, after that, I decided, okay, I know how to do them. Let's see if I can be the best at them. So then I started going with um, winning medals, obviously. And then after winning medals, it's not enough to win a medal. Now my father was like, hey, you're going to do something. You're still the best. So, uh, yeah, I started trying to break records. And starting to break records. And I want to be some more than that so i went to provincial teams after that national teams and obviously then bigger competitions worldwide competitions like overseas sounds like you're mostly competing with yourself in life that's what you're <laughs> in life you don't compete with other people you compete with yourself that's how you self-motivate that's how you you develop yourself as an individual you know what i mean if you're always comparing yourself to somebody else your self-development will be based on someone else's criteria or someone else's uh life path you have to have your own path you know what i mean you live your own life uh you go through your own experiences uh your own trial to relations and uh, if you you base your life on other people then you you're not going to get much advancement. One thing that uh, struck me is that this exploratory mindset that you tried a lot of things. I had a wrong assumption about you is that that you started with track and field. Mm. But later on, it just organically developed. Exactly. 
So who were your inspirations growing up, whether it's athletics or anything else? Obviously, you had to follow your own path. You didn't really follow anybody's path. But was there anybody that inspired you or a group of people that inspired you to become who you are today? I ain't gonna lie to you. When I was a little kid, I didn't have much um, like role models. Uh, I have originally uh, in my life wanted to be um, uh, maybe a police officer, something like that. Why? Because uh, I grew up in Marvel, right? Everyone loves Marvel. And with uh, the mindset of what Marvel gives you, you have to be an outstanding individual. You have to push yourself. You have to stand out. You have to do things uh, with integrity, meaning do things with not, not, not trying to receive anything from it, right? And with that mentality, I, uh, funny story. So I was at home. I'm thinking about the age of 12. Yeah, about the age of 12. And the Olympics were on. And uh, it was a um, 100-meter race. At that point, I didn't really know what the Olympics was yet. And I never seen it. So Olympics were on. And my mom called me to the, to the living room. And she's like, Hank, your cousin's on TV. And I'm like, my cousin? So I ran up to the screen. And I saw this individual. He was from Trinidad. My background is Venezuela and Trinidad. So I went up to the, um, the screen. And you saw this individual from Trinidad. And he had amazing black, white, and red suit. And he had these glasses on. So that image, right, at 12 years old, being a Marvel fan, saw this image of this dude that's my family member that has this incredible, like, look, right? So I'm like, all right, he's my family. I want to be a superhero like this guy. You know what I mean? Like, he's running super fast, fastest in the world. You know what I mean? So when you see the race and your mom's telling you that's you in the future, technically, right? So I went out to the dollar store the, directly the next day. Mind you, I'm 12 years old. And I buy a whole bunch of glasses, different colors to match my T-shirt or outfits I had. And that was the image that I had. His name was Alto Bolton. Alto Bolton. Yeah. And, and to make a long story short, real quick, if you advance four years later, I almost quit track. I almost quit track because I started getting, you know, motivated to go to the Olympics and, you know, make a career out of it, et cetera, because I was winning a lot of medals. I told my coach one day, you know what? I'm going to quit track because I don't see me advancing as a professional athlete in track. I should go back to soccer, hockey, et cetera. So my coach said, do one more meet and uh, I guarantee you I will change your life. So I did one more meet. Uh, I got five gold medals. Uh, they put my picture in the Gazette at the time. And uh, the next day was my birthday. My coach picked me up, dragged me to this big, huge uh, building. And I was like, listen, I can't buy McDonald's with these medals. I can't go up to the, like, the cash register and put a medal on the, on the, on the table, the counter, and say, give me a Big Mac. You know what I mean? I, I need a change in my life. You know what I mean? I might go back to hockey because I was good in that at the time. Or even football. So we went to this building and we went to an office uh, in the back of the building. I sat down on the couch and two gentlemen came in. When they came in, they said, hey, Hank Palmer, we heard a lot about you and uh, we want to congratulate you on the five gold medals. And um, I didn't know who these guys were. And I'm like, how do you know my name? And was it to you if I won some medals? You know what I mean? He's like, did you take a look around? Do you notice anything? I'm looking around and I see some posters, you know, skateboarding, uh, snowboarding, uh, BMX, which I was into, right? And uh, some girl running. And then I didn't notice behind me. He's like, did you see the photo behind you? And I turned around me, and there he was, Alto Bolton. He's like, do you know who that individual is? I'm like, yeah, he runs for Trinidad. Mind you, I didn't tell you guys, Alto Bolton's not my cousin. He's had no relation whatsoever. But my parents instilled that image in my mind that allowed me to push towards a certain direction, right? Um, so yeah, so it was like, you know, that I'm like, yeah, Alto Bolton. He's like, well, you know what? We sponsored Alto Bolton. Those shades he's wearing, that's Oakley. And I'm like, Oakley. So this is Oakley? Yeah, you're in the Oakley warehouse. Oakley Canada. And we represent Oakley. And then they point to the corner of the cabinet with a whole bunch of shades. It's like, you like shades? I'm like, yeah. I bought a whole bunch of them. So mind you, I bought shades from the dollar store. I opened this, up this, opened this cabinet, and I'm talking about shades that go from anywhere from $300 to $1,000 shades. So I'm looking at these shades. I'm looking at them, trying them on in the mirror and everything. And I noticed even one of the shades is actual Alto Bolton shades, the red and black. So I try them on, I put them back. They're watching me very carefully as I'm picking and choosing and trying them on. I sit back down. He's like, so what do you think? Yeah, they're pretty cool, pretty cool. But why am I here? And, it's, and, it's, and they said, um, wait one second. They both left the room. One guy came back with a metal box. Another guy came back with um, some papers. One guy went to the cabinet, uh, carefully uh, chose every glass uh, pair of shades that I tried on significantly, significant, significantly, right? Put them in the, the, the metal box, the padded metal box, and put them in my lap. And he's like, here. I'm like, here what? He's like, these are yours. I'm like, actually, you know, they're yours. <laughs> and I'm not going to steal. <laughs> but uh, he said, these are yours. And these are going to be yours uh, forever. Uh, we're going to sponsor you now. 
we want, uh, we see the potential in you the same way we saw potential in Alto Bolton. And uh, we want to bring you to that same level. And if you want, we sign this contract, we will sponsor you to the point where we will pay you if you um, wear the shades. And every time you have a picture in the paper, every time you win a medal, every time you need to travel, we'll help you out and we'll make sure you reach your Olympic goal. Wow, that's that's an amazing story, man. I had no idea. And that year after that, I made national team. Wow. That's 16. My first national team at 16. Other than the shades, of course, like you, uh, you're thinking about a, a career in hockey. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems like it's more the recognition aspect of, you know what, like you're being recognized for something that you put a lot of effort in. Is that what drove you ultimately? Recognition? Not really, because it's, it's, it's more, a more of self-defeat. You know what I mean? Like track and field is not an easy sport. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of injuries that go along with it. A lot of hours training. Uh, you train for four years to run 10 seconds, bro. You know what I mean? When you really think about it. At 200 meters, 20 seconds, right? Hours, the amount of hours and, and sleepless days and, and pain and, and suffering and throwing up and, uh, and injuries, you know what I mean? And, and mental stress, you know what I mean? From sponsors, from training, from family members, from everything, right? Just for a few seconds. What are the stresses that say, let's say you receive from, let's say, sponsors? You have to make times. You have to do performances, right? You have specific meets you have to go to and make certain times or placements for a second third wow that's a, that's a lot riding on you at that point was there any point that you uh, you look back and wonder what life could have been let's say if you picked the hockey path so you're really sure about track and field and obviously you made um, beijing olympics like how did you feel when you finally got to the stage where you literally were one of the best of the best on the entire planet it was a struggle man it was a struggle going there Uh, two years before the Olympic Games, I, I got injured twice, two years in a row. I can't begin to like tell you how much frustration I went through. I almost quit the year before Olympics. The year before Olympic Games, like 2007, I was going to quit. I kept on getting injured, a little stressed out. Uh, a lot of people said I was uh, I was someone that was good when he was young, but when he got old, couldn't handle the stress, and couldn't handle the pressure. And uh, I gave it a little more go. Uh, I got the confidence. Um, late in 2007 and the first race i did was in the states actually in new york and uh not only did i be my personal best but i beat the meet record which still holds up to today since 2008 which was 6.67 it was my first race of the year so right there i got the confidence right back uh jump right back in the saddle i said this year is going to be my year and that year uh I pushed really hard, uh, broke my 200 meter uh, personal best two, uh, ranked second in the country for uh, third, second in the country until nationals, second in the country until nationals. Uh, 100 meter, I was still trying to get my rank up. Uh, two weeks before nationals, I injured myself right before nationals, uh, pulled my adductor muscle, couldn't walk. I was in a wheelchair two weeks before. For how long were you in a wheelchair? Literally a week before. How did you manage? I was in crutches to try to put pressure on my leg, to force pressure on my leg. It was far enough that by car, it would take at least a day and by plane, a few hours. And my coach flew me out to make sure I'm not cramped up in a car. Still limping at the time, seeing a lot of physios and um, massage therapists. Got to nationals, still limping, barely able to run. It was a struggle, man. Uh, the qualification round, barely made it to qualifications. Uh, semifinals, you're in heats. Uh, tell you the story of the heats. Uh, I was in the, the second to last heat. What's a heat? Heats. Uh, so you have, uh, like, let's say you have, okay, there's eight lanes. Let's say you have um, 16, uh, 16 runners, right? Uh, you would have only two rounds, and the first round would be two heats, right? Eight and eight. If you have more runners, obviously more than 16, you would have three heats and separate the rounds equally. So I was the second heat of the semifinals. Uh, there was three heats and uh, of eight. And uh, pretty much my time was six. Uh, no, sorry. It was 10.36. And normally that's not really a qualifying time. And uh, the last race, I actually stayed in the booth at the end of the race to see the last race because I was the second one. And I, I, I wait for the, the third round. And uh, the third heat, at ran the last qualifier the last like fast time actually was also 1036 so the last qualifying time they put on the board was 1036 we will have the same time 
So just to tell you how much I almost would not be an Olympic athlete today is literally by a hair because the time that separated both of us was 10.36, uh, 10.36.6 and 10.36.7. So that's the, uh, the fraction of space is like this. So I made the finals by this much. Despite an injury. Exactly. So at this point, the finals were the next day. And um, I was in my room, uh, feeling good about making the finals, but not feeling so good about my leg because my leg was all busted. And um, I was limping and shit still. And uh, pretty much I heard some, you know, people talking in the hall saying, yo, man, how come this How come this cat's trying to run? Like, he's running with one leg. Like, I should have made the finals. Like, this is bullshit, you know what I mean? And I'm hearing this, like, negative neg negativity, right? And I'm like, shit, like, maybe I shouldn't be running. Maybe I should give up my spot. When I really think about it, I'm trying to make Olympic Games, and these these cats are, like, 100%. These cats have been training just as hard as me, but they don't have an injury, right? They have better chance of, of competing. So, um, pretty much, I went to that. I went through that all night, all that uh, like like thought process of should I run tomorrow? Should I, am I going to embarrass myself? Do I really have a chance? Uh, when it came to the the final round, uh, I actually sat in the corner and I just I was just contemplating I'm like shit. Do I go up to that line? Do I take that chance? And uh, literally five minutes before I ran, coach came up to me. He's like, uh, "What are you doing?" And I said, uh, "I don't know. I don't think I should run. I'm injured. I can barely walk. I'm limping." He's like, "Hank." And I'm surprised it took me so long to answer this question. Hank, how many times in your life or how many chances do you have in your life to make the 2008 Olympic Games? And I sat there and I thought, how many times? How many times do I have left? And I'm like, how many times? Wait, it's the 2008 Olympics. He didn't say, how many times do I have to make the Olympics? He said, the 2008 Olympics. I said, one. I have one chance. I actually have a chance. And that's what hit me. I actually have a chance to make it. Why? Because I'm about to line up. It's like, how many years have you been training? I'm like, many years. He's like, so why would you waste all those years of training that gave you this one opportunity that many people don't get? And I said, yo, fuck this shit. I'm getting up. I got up, limping and all, shades on, lined up, lane eight. And if you guys don't know what it looks like when you're running, there's eight lanes. And I'm in the far, far lane. So everyone's on the left, uh, the right side of me. I get in the blocks. I put my head down. I take a big breath and I just think about positivity, positive things. I don't think about my pain no more. I'm just thinking the opportunity that I have. I'm thinking about all the individuals that know the opportunity that I have. All the individuals that supported me all this time. They're looking at the TV screen right now saying this guy is going to make it. My friends, my family, loved ones, sponsors, my my background, my, my, my struggle to get to this point. And I said, I just want to get from point A to point B. So I just kept on saying to myself, run. So I kept on saying, just run, just run. My head went down. Most, remember, I have Oakley shades. So no one can see my eyes, right? So my eyes were closed. I was just focusing on actually being already an Olympic athlete. The fact that I was there. The fact that I, I, I went through that struggle. So I, my head went down. I heard set. Took a big breath. I held it. Gun went off. Started driving, driving, driving. Eyes are closed at this point. Pumping, pumping. In the dry phase. Pushing, 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 pushing. 40 meters. 45. 50. At 50 meters, I hear people just screaming, Hank, go, Hank. And I'm like, shit, why are these cats screaming my name? I keep on pushing. 55, um, uh, 60 meters, 70. Yo, they're not going to catch you. And now I'm, I'm getting confused. Why are these guys screaming they're not going to catch me? So I opened up my eyes. Remember, I only have a peripheral vision of the right side. So I barely open my eyes to the right, and I see nobody. I look in front of me. I see nobody. I keep on running. 75, 80. I'm starting to see fingertips on my, in my peripheral. So I think to myself, am I in front or is the race over? Am I awake right now? I don't understand what's going on. But my legs, I don't feel my legs. All I tell myself is run, 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 run. It's like a computer, right? Just do what the brain tells you to do. So I hit 85, 90. I start hearing breath, huffing and puffing. I start seeing shoulders. Shit. Yo, I'm in front? Keep on running. 95, 96, 97. People are coming on the side of me. We're all lined up. I'm losing my focus. I stopped, dri I stopped uh, driving my knees. 98, 99, boom, people fly by me. I'm like, shit, we're all lined up. And the, the speed that everyone caught up to me, because I lost my focus, I didn't know what happened. I'm out of breath, I take a knee, I look up at the scoreboard. Mind you, the scoreboard is not normally on point with the times and the names. So I see Hank Palmer second with uh, 10, uh, 10.21, I think it was, 10.21 at the time. And I was like, shit. It's going to take forever for them to fix that scoreboard. 
There's no way I got second. And no way I ran that time. Because that would be the fastest time I ever ran in my life. But I'm injured, so that's impossible. So I take a knee. I'm waiting. I'm like, please, let me at least get, like, fourth place so I can make the relay team. So I, I walk over to the scoreboard, and I'm still waiting for him to fix the, fix the times up there. And the guy can go over to me. Hey, congratulations. Going to the Olympics. And I'm like, no, what do you mean? I got fourth? He's like, no, you got second. The time's up there. Am I the right time? And then it wasn't hitting me yet. And then one of my, my like, I say colleagues, one of my fellow athletes come up to me. He's like, yo, congratulations, man. That's a, that's a wicked time. And a tear dropped from my eye. And that, at that point, that's where the image of actually Golden Phoenix, like, went through my mind. Golden Phoenix represents for me building individuals from the ground up and making them realize their mental is way more important than the physical. And the only way to build a physical is if the mental is ready to adapt to whatever's around them. When I ran that race, no matter what was wrong with me physically, my mental blocked that out and carried me from point A to point B faster than I've ever ran in my entire life up to today. But that was the most injured I've ever been up to today. I was not able to walk two weeks prior, let alone a few hours before. Physios and massage therapists said I shouldn't run because of my injury. But yet I ran faster than I ever ran in my entire life. So the power of the mind over the body made me realize that there's so much more to training than just lifting weights. So much more to training than just sweating and throwing up. But why the Phoenix? Because there is this aspect of resurrection that your uh, transformation that you're bringing here. So in that moment, did you think of that? The Phoenix, I already made, I already created the Phoenix, like the, 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 the concept of the Phoenix. Concept of the Phoenix is I, I burn you to ashes, meaning I take you how you are and I rebuild you from the ground up. When the, when the Phoenix goes into the sun, he burns to ashes, he rebuilds himself from his own ashes into something bigger or stronger. That's what I do with Golden Phoenix, right? I talk about what your past is, whether it be sports, whether it be injuries, etc. And I build upon that. I try to work on people's stability, their core strength, their mental strength. I push them past whatever fears or, or, or hurdles they've gone through in the, in the past. You know what I mean? Like, if you come up to me and say, Hank, I can't do this, I'll tell you, if I, could, if I didn't think you could do this, I wouldn't make you do it. I've had that moment so many times with you. And I love when people say, I can't do this. I'm like, oh, yeah? Watch. I bet you can. And then when you do do it, that's golden finish right there. Let's say... A young athlete or someone who is considering delving into the world of athleticism is listening to us right now. What would you say to that young athlete about the core spirit of athleticism? The core spirit of athleticism is to, be, is to not be afraid of pushing yourself past your mental and physical limits. Because we don't have a limit. We, when we train, we can't have limits. You can't be afraid to go faster. A lot of people... They don't reach the, the pinnacle of their physical or mental um, attributes because they're afraid of what's going to happen when they get there. What did you sacrifice to become who you are today? And what have you gained in return? Hmm. Well, there's a lot of aspects to that. What, do you, what, what aspect of, of my life are you talking about? In general, uh, to become who you are today, there are things that you had to uh, not do. For example, you had to prioritize training over other things or make certain life decisions that let's say a non-athlete would not make? I separate myself from people. The only way to focus on yourself is to separate yourself from society. At one point, you have to disengage and focus on who you are and who you want to be. Isn't that lonely? No, because it, it, you don't, don't get it twisted. You're not, you're not becoming a loner, right? You're still, you're still going out, you're meeting people, you're meeting different people. You're, 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 you're discovering the world but you're not stuck. For instance, as an athlete, a professional athlete, I started traveling a lot, uh, had girlfriends, et cetera. I never based um, decision to travel based on friends, family, girlfriends, or the society I was in. If I had to go away for three months, I went away for three months. If I had to go in the middle of summer, I went in the middle of summer. If I had to go in the middle of winter, I went in the middle of winter. I did what I had to do to develop myself. I mean, some days, sometimes I'd be gone for four months. There was one time I was stuck in Italy. I had to make the time to compete. Um, I mean, to, 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 um, to continue getting um, my, uh, my bursaries, right, as an athlete, to con continue as a professional, a professional athlete. And I stayed in Europe traveling from meet to meet to meet 
for I think almost five to six months from the beginning of the summer to the end of the summer. I didn't leave either. I mean, whether I was lonely, whether I missed home, friends, family, girlfriend, et cetera, I did not leave until I, I got to my goal. I, I was tired. I was frustrated. At one point I'm like, you know, fuck this. I just want to go back home. But because I kept on pushing that year, one of my good friends that lives in Italy, I was talking to him on the, um, um, on the phone and he was like, yo, come to this part of Italy and uh, there's this meet. And just in case, you know, someone drops out, we can throw you in there. You'd be running with some of the fastest guys in the world. So I went there to hang out with him uh, primarily, uh, struggling with injuries all, always. And I mean, that's track and field. His mom was also a physio, so she was working on me. And the night before the meet, she tells me, Hank, someone dropped out of the, one of the big 100 meter races. You want to jump in? I'm like, you sure? It's like, yeah, 100%. So the next day when I was warming up, I realized I was in a, I was uh, racing uh, alongside of uh, Asafa Powell, who was an already world record holder. So I was actually having the same uniform that he had when he broke that world record the first time. So I had the opportunity to warm up next to Asafa Powell, mimic a little bit of his warm up. When I got into the, the heat, I was in lane one, the camera was on me because he was wearing a different um, uniform than when he broke the record. And I was wearing his uniform that he broke in the first record. You can actually see it on YouTube. You look at Asafa Powell, world record, second world record. The camera is actually on me. I was wearing a green, a blue and green uh, uniform. Uh, the the camera was on me for the first maybe 10 to 20 meters. And when I stand up, the camera realized it wasn't me and shift over to the middle. That race that I ran in was the world, the second world record that Asafa broke. And my personal best for that summer. So because I waited... And made that sacrifice to just keep on traveling and keep on pushing throughout that summer. I stayed in Europe until like August, I think September, like end of September. And uh, normally we don't run for that long, right? And uh, it was getting cold outside too. And uh, because I, I, I made that sacrifice to wait that long, not only was I able to make my goal for the season, but I was able to run in the most one of the most historical races of track and field that you can still watch up to today. On television. I mean, on YouTube. Correct me if I'm wrong, but... You're wrong. <laughs> but it, it, it seems like, you know what, uh, the sacrifices you made uh, did not really feel like sacrifice because you were so focused on your goal. That's exactly what you wanted to do. So there was everything to gain. Yeah, I'm still going to say it wrong. It, it's, it's not that easy. It sounds easy to say, but it's, it's not easy, man. Uh, it's, it's building Golden Phoenix. You know what I mean? Like... When I first created Golden Phoenix and uh, pushed it to the point where it is today, uh, I was coaching at McGill University at the time. And then I stopped coaching McGill University to really develop myself as an entrepreneur in the sport, right? Uh, track and field teams weren't that big at the time, but I wanted to build it into something incredible. So I, that year, 2008, I created the logo that you guys see today, right? I spent a long time, me, myself, no one else created, like I didn't have a, um, no artist draw it. It literally sat in my living room with my computer attached to my, my big screen to look at the details. And I, I wanted something that was simple like Nike, but stood out like a badge. You know what I mean? And that when everyone saw it, they knew exactly what the fuck they were looking at, right? And um, to this day, I'm very proud of that logo. And I never really, I've made uh, complimentary logos, let's say, that, uh, that have the GP and, and, and uh, the, what else I do? Uh, and then other uh, cool logos and slogans like uh, I can and I will, right? But at the end of the day, the core logo is the bird, right? The phoenix. And um, pretty much when I first started coaching, people said, oh, you think because you're an Olympic athlete, you can be a coach? You think just because you run fast, you can be a coach? I'm like, no. I made a lot of sacrifices to run fast. I was never a big guy. I learned what it was to move from point A to point B. When I went through that, 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 at the time I told you at, uh, at Olympic trials, it changed me. You know what I mean? It changed the way I see life. It changed the way I see the world itself and, and the body and, and motor functions and biomechanics, the way the brain functions. And with that, I created a program in which helps people go past their limitations. And the first two years, it wasn't easy. You know what I mean? I started with one athlete. And by the time, I think five years in, I had the most athletes in the Quebec Federation under one coach. I had 150 athletes. At the time, the biggest club was like 20 to 25. 
like sprinting club, like performance, right? I'm not talking about road run, uh, road runners. You know what I mean? I mean actually performance, right? So at the before then, the federation didn't want big clubs like that. Why? I don't know. They weren't promoting it. But then after when I did it two years in a row, they started promoting. Now you see all the clubs doing the same thing. You know what I mean? I made it cool to be a part of a track team. So you were a pioneer, basically. I tried to be. You know what I mean? Uh, when when people when kids joined my my track team, I gave them a free T-shirt, the Golden Phoenix logo. We had this bright yellow T-shirt, and everywhere you saw in Stone Cold or VR, you saw that bright bright yellow T-shirt. Whether you're in soccer, whether you're in gymnastics, whether you're in football, whether you're in track, I touched every sport. I didn't just deal with track and field athletes. I developed individuals and relationships to the point where I'll tell you, I work at World Gym today, and as, as you know. And uh, uh, coaches at World Gym, like Jeffrey and uh, Dan Tran, were athletes with me. You know what I mean? I started with me. And now that are coaches because they, they felt that inspiration. That they felt that push that I gave them uh, 10 years ago, over 10 years ago. So it's, it's, it's a community uh, that I wanted to develop, an understanding of, of what it is to push yourself past your mental and physical capabilities to the point where now they do the same thing for other people. You have such an intricate and unique system of training, uh, but one thing that I can't wrap my head around, there are so many internet gurus or even uh, professional athletes that are trying to sell their own technique and uh, brand it that way, but you refuse to make it monolithic. You refuse to write anything down or even make uh, a video series of tutorial out of it. You, you, rem you remind me of you know those ancient Indian gurus or those senseis of uh, long ago so what's the reason behind your um, refusal to set them on paper because we always have to 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 adapt to every individual i i don't think it would be when it comes to training for me every single person i, I work with has their own issues has their own past Uh, own complications, own own um, hurdles to get past um, when it comes to developing themselves. I work with people directly. I don't give them a piece of paper and say, "Okay, do this thing and get well." That's not what Golden Phoenix means to me. I'm I'm I want to say teacher, but I'm not a teacher. I'm someone that wants to inspire and help people grow. I want to work with people. If I just wanted to make a program, put on a piece of paper and sell it, then I wouldn't be Golden Phoenix. There's, there's no point of, of me doing what I do anymore. I should just literally write a book, put on a piece of paper, and then fuck off, do something else in my life. I do this because I like working with people. I don't do this for money. I don't do this to make a living, even though... I kind of do, you know what I mean? I make money other ways also, you know what I mean? I don't have to do this. I do this because I'm inspired to do it. I'm doing it because of my community. I'm doing it because uh, it's it's a part of me. Uh, during COVID, COVID was a really hard time for me. And uh, not being able to see kids, uh, see my athletes, uh, and and be with, there with them and, and, and push them, I almost quit track. I almost quit completely. I stepped away for for a good a good moment, and with that, um, the people that inspired me to come back and 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 remind myself who I am was was people like Jeffrey, Danny Tran, uh, Nate, uh, some of my athletes I've been coaching for years, and that's that that's what I'm talking about when I instilled something in them that helped me come back to the track. You know what I mean? And uh, also what, what uh, threw me off, too, is I'm also in the military. And two years ago, um, I injured my arm to the point where I was paralyzed. I have um, a pinched nerve in my spine. And uh, I was in extreme pain for six months. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even do a push-up. And uh, it made me contemplate my choices joining the military, to be honest with you. Life choices. Because I was completely paralyzed. I couldn't use my arm. My, my left arm turned into a noodle. You know what I mean? And uh, what and again, what inspired me was my athletes. My athletes, they see everything I've done, all I've accomplished, and then the fact that I'm in the military at such an older age and and kept on pushing through and, and wanted to make something of it. I just didn't do it for the hell of it. I really want 
I want to be a sergeant one day. You know what I mean? And uh, the fact that I was injured and they still looked at me and said, yo, don't worry, man, you'll get through this. Made me literally want to go back on my course right away. The doctor said it would take me two years to rebuild my arm. They inspired me to go back literally after that sixth month, a seven month, I went back to my unit. I was walking in my hall in the hallway and uh, my college sergeant was like, so you hit you on the next course? I said, I want to, but I'm not able to do a push up. I can't push myself off the floor. And he said, oh, don't worry. It's not physical. It's just the classroom. So I signed up first day in. All right, on your face. I'm like, uh, um, Sergeant, uh, can't do a push-up. He's like, you have a medical paper? I'm like, yes. He's like, all right. So the first day I felt like a little bitch. I was like, fuck, all these guys pushing around me. I can't be like this. My athletes wouldn't be proud of me. People that know me wouldn't be proud of me. So what I did every night before I went to sleep, put myself in a push-up position. And I pushed on the floor this much. Every day, I spent at least 20 minutes just just little movements until little movements became bigger movements, became bigger movements to the, the point where I was just pushing one arm. At least I was coming off the floor. But I was doing this rep repetition so much that my wrists are getting sore. We were backpacking one day. I tripped. I fell on that same wrist, and it swelled up. So now I can't bend my hand. So now I have to adapt. I still want to pass this course. I don't want to fail again. So now I have a cast on my hand. And I don't want another reason to say I can't do a push-up because I've been working so hard. So I adapted myself. I learned to do a push-up on my knuckles. But in the military, when you have to do a push-up, you do a push-up where you are. If you're in the mud, if you're on gravel, if you're in the water, if you're on grass, if you're on cement, they say on your face get down. So then I adapted myself. By the time I ended that course, better be right. I I was able to do a push-up. You know what I mean? And I'm just saying all this that just to say that my experience in my life has just driven me with complication after complication that I had to overcome. All these hurdles in life that said, yo, it's either you drop dead and be finished with whatever you're trying to do or you get the fuck up, pick yourself up and just do it. That's why I always tell people when they say, oh, I can't. It's not that you can't. You choose not to. I can't means I didn't fail yet because you already gave up. The only way to fail is to keep on trying until you actually cannot you know what I mean? For me, my, my slogan, I can and I will, is to say, I'm going to keep on doing this until my body adapts to whatever the fuck I'm doing so that it does it. We're human beings. We adapt to everything. Shit, we got through COVID, didn't we? Yeah, we did. We, we adapted. You know what I mean? Climate change, we adapted. We're made to adapt. So don't ever tell me you can't do something. You can. You eventually will. It all depends if you want to. Also, one thing that I finally understand about Golden Phoenix now is that it's not a static system. It's a dynamic system you're trying to build that is a feedback of community because you're giving a lot of credits to your your athletes. And that, that's inspiring, actually. It's like that you're taking into account the inspiration that you're receiving from the people that you trained. Of course. It's energy, man. Positivity, law of attraction. Yeah, I mean, my life is based on helping people. Whether you, they see it like that or not, like the only reason I do what I do is because I'm, I'm committed to to helping people and making people learn and making people push themselves to places where they didn't think were possible. I enjoy doing that. I can do anything else in life, bro. I've done I've done movies. I've done acting. I've done home renovation. Uh, I've done I've done a lot of things. You know what I mean? And uh, I I've, I've made careers out of it. You know what I mean? I do security. I'm in the military. You know what I mean? But what I've never stopped doing, and I will, I don't think I'll ever stop doing, is helping people bypass the physical and mental obstacles in life. It's funny that you mentioned law of attraction because you often talk about it. 
which gets confounded into many definitions and school of thoughts on the internet. Uh, so I want to hear it from you. So what is it to you and why is it so important? Law of attraction is a state of mind. If, uh, law of attraction uh, implies, uh, okay, someone wants to, um, all right, let's say today, Rick, you tell me, Hank, I want to join the military. All right. What are you going to do about it? Well, I want to join. All right, then cool. That it? Yeah. And then that's it. That's not how law of attraction works. Law of attraction works in the sense of if you really profoundly want to join the military, everything you do will relate to wanting to join the military. You will start training yourself to be already prepared to be already on the force. You will do hikes. You will do push-ups. You will do squats. You will do runs. You will get up early in the morning. You will make your bed. You will create a routine that you already feel you're in that state. You will do these things that will attract like things to you. Once I started um, my journey towards the military and I started talking about it, if you really want something to happen to you, you start talking about it. So I, I always mention to individuals around me, so what are you into? Oh, I want to join the military. Really? I once joined. Oh, so yeah, you did? Oh, yeah. And then I started meeting a whole bunch of people that were in the military. And then those, those people related me to other people that are in the military. But you won't get those things if you stay silent. You won't get those things if you just say it once and then go on with something else. You have to be obsessed with getting to that point, which takes us back to me in that race. I got behind those blocks and I kept on saying to myself, run, run, run. So that's all my body knew. My body, I wasn't telling myself oh, about my injury, all oh, about the pain. Oh, but the other, the other athletes, that's why I'm in track and field. Track and field is about you, your, your struggle, your, your, your fight against yourself. The only thing that can stop you is you. Everyone else is just background. So if you want to do something, you'll get there. You want to, look, you're, you're in shape right now, right? You're, you're in better shape than you were before. Why are you getting this? You will, but you got in that shape. Why? Because you promoted it. You said every day, okay, shit, I need to do this. You promoted it. You put it out, you put it out there. So people started talking about you. Then you found me. Why? Because you promoted it. You wanted that shit. So then here I am. And then we started working together. For me, it was more, more of an obsession, actually. Uh, no, but, but you talked about it. You said, yo, Hank, you're in the military? Yeah. You found that out. Why? Because you want to know everything about me so I can help you. So then you want military training. And we, when we did those first few trainings, I kicked your ass. Oh, yeah. I want to see if you really wanted it. Why I want to see if you really want it? Because you promoted that to me. You show me you really want it. Not everyone comes up to me and says, like, I really want this. I did this. I used, to, I used to see this coach and this coach. If you didn't tell me all that shit, I wouldn't know how much you really want it. I would think you're like every other person. Yeah, I just want to lose you know, weight, you know, a little chubby. You know, you know. No, you said, Hank, I've been through this. I've been through that. You gave me the details. So I understood what you wanted. So I helped push you ultimately to that ultimate goal. Every time you came to train, I kicked your ass. If you threw up, you threw up. I said, wipe your mouth. Let's go. Keep on going. If I didn't know you wanted that bad, if you didn't promote that, that law of attraction to promote to me and everyone else that you want that bad. Look how many people support what you do. Um, so many people are involved. The other coaches are involved. Why? Because you put it out there. It really helps me persevere. I'll be honest. But you put it out there. You doing this podcast is putting it out there. You inspired. You inspiring others helps inspire you. Look how many videos you made uh, tr being trained by an Olympic athlete. Part two, part three, four, five, six. What are we at now? 44. 40 something. Exactly. But you didn't do that before because you didn't push it as much. Now you're inspired more. You've pushed yourself to that next level. So you're even more inspired. So you're inspired to even do more. You know what I mean? Like that's a lot of attraction. You, you push something and then it, it dom there's a domino effect. It all depends on how much you want to push. So that's, that's the law of attraction. The other day you came up to me was like, Hank, uh, I feel different now. And I'm like, what? I don't, I don't, I don't like what I see. I want to get abs. Because I was always comfortable with whatever, but now I really want to ask. Why? Because you put it out there, bro. You changed your life. You changed the way you see yourself. But you helped me help you. But if you didn't help me help you, then you would just be where you were before. It's a law of attraction. You have to put out what you want. Ask, it's like they say with the genie. Uh, you know what they say, the, the, the genie, the, 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 the story with the genie? The, the whole thing about the genie is the, the part of the law of attraction. The genie comes out the, the lamp and he says, uh, my wish is your command. The universe is like that. I, t I talk about that with, with um, my fiance all the time, actually. Me and my fiance have been together since like what? Since, since officially 
um, December, but I've known her since October. And since then, me and her talk a lot, like a lot, every single day. And um, we use a lot of attraction. We talk about what we want every single day. And we've evolved as a couple beyond anything I could ever imagine. I mean, less than a year ago, I didn't live in this beautiful apartment. Less than a year ago, she wasn't a, a, like a professional trainer. She was training people, but she went to that next level. Why? Because she promoted that. It starts with promotion. It starts with actually vocalizing what you want. Put it out there. You know what I mean? And if you if you really want it, you attract like things. I met her. and She was as passionate about me. And she wanted to work in World Gym. But she really wanted to work in the same one that I was working in. But what, what we say about God is they, they give you a lot of attraction. They give you what you want, but not the way you want it. Because the way you want it might not be the best way. And you have to be open-minded. Me even working at, in, in, in Lackety wasn't what I wanted originally. Originally, I wanted to work in Griffintown. I was working in Griffintown. And then randomly, uh, the, um, the manager said, hey, how would you like to work in Lackety? It's closer to where you live. I'm like, yeah, but I want to work, work in Griffintown. Yeah, but there's opportunity for you in Lackety. And I'm like, eh. and then something clicked in my head. I'm like, wait a second. I had a feeling. I mean, you just have a gut feeling. I was like, all right, cool. What's your address? I've never been there before. This is during COVID. And I went there. And the day after, COVID, boom, shut down. And I got a call a few weeks later. Hank, we need you to train everybody. What do you mean? Here's a list. <whistles> the gym was closed. So what I do? I made shit work. I took all the, all the equipment, put it outside. Start training people outside. Taking people to the track. Made it work. You have to, bro. If you really want something, you make it work. And today, I'm still there. And because I'm there, I was able to meet my beautiful fiance. If I never made that choice to switch from Griffintown to go to Lackety, I never met her. And before her, I told everyone, I'm done with dating. I'm done with girls, man. What bullshit, you know what I mean? Wasting my time. I always complain about my shit, you know what I mean? I do security at night, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, a, I'm, um, um, I'm a military, you know what I mean? The girls can't handle that. And it's just wasting my time. And I train all a lot, you know what I mean? And I met someone randomly who is into training, who doesn't complain about me working the nightlife, who likes the fact that I'm in the military. Law of attraction, bro. If you really want to succeed in something, focus on it. Don't say, oh, I think I want or I kind of want. No, give it your all, 100%. Like you're doing right now to get fit, get in shape. You're pushing yourself, pushing your limits. Sending me videos. Hank, I just did a new PR. That's what, that's, what, that's what it's about. What's next? It's always think about what is next. Two plates. Fuck yeah. Gang. Beijing Olympics was in uh, 2008. We are now uh, 2022. Uh, it's been 14 years and you're 37 now and you still keep on pushing beyond your limits. Uh, do most athletes keep on pushing so hard after so many years or some succumb to their comfort zone? Some most succumb to their comfort zone. What stopped you from settling in your comfort zone? Mentality and a little bit of my athletes too, you know what I mean? Like I could get comfortable, but again, because I decided to, to, to have the career that I, I decided to make with Golden Phoenix... I, I, I almost raised kids, you know what I mean? To the point where they were pushing me to keep on moving. Like Jeffrey, you know what I mean? Like some days I'd be like, oh man, I feel sluggish. I don't feel like really working out. And Jeffrey would be like, yo, let's do bench. I'm like, nah, man, I'm not really feeling it. And he'll study up and like, and he'll do a rep and be like, so you're next. And I'm like, fuck, all right, let's go. You know what I mean? I'd be like, let me get my pre-workout. Hold on. You know what I mean? Like it's again, law of attraction. If you want to be successful, like the, 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 what the saying is, I don't know how successful you are by seeing the three people that are no, the three or five people that are closest to you. If the, the, the closest people to you are people that are negative or talk negatively or don't want to evolve themselves, you're going to be the, the sixth. That's how it works. If you want to develop yourself, you got to stay positive and your positivity will bring positive, positive people in your life. Choose your thoughts carefully, then vocalize them carefully and pick the people in your life carefully, basically. OQP. Only quality people, bro. When I say quality people, I mean spirit and mind, bro. Spirit and mind. That's what's important. You told me about having ADHD. How did this affect your life and has it impacted your goals as an athlete? I don't know what to say about that, man. It's just go, 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 man. Like, no limits. As long as I can go, I go. No excuses. So you never bitched about, oh, I could have had this or I could have done this. You just kept. Bitching, uh, that's a waste of time, bro. Time I spend bitching could be doing shit. 
you were coaching at McGill to train the next generation of sprinters. How were you coached during your younger years and how is your coaching different when you coach, let's say, um, future sprinters? As a coach, you're always evolving. I mean, yes, I have a lot of experience because I've been doing a lot of different sports my entire life, but I've coached people and learned from people. You know what I mean? Um, you learn different injuries, how people uh, adapt to their own injuries, how you can help them adapt to their own injuries uh, while they're while they're while you're while you're taking care of an injury. For instance, uh, um, reconstructive surgery on the knee, right? Achilles tendon or something like that. You learn how different people adapt to your training and how you can adapt to their injury getting better faster than others. You know what I mean? Like what I did differently or what maybe they did a little bit extra differently. That's why communication is important. You know what I mean? Uh, I helped a football guy uh, get over um, reconstructive surgery on his knee in three to four months. You know what I mean? To the point where he's able to run. You know I mean, without a brace. But um, again, it depends on the individual. It depends how much you can push the individual. It depends on how much they recover. Like I always tell you about rolling, right? And um, 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 stretching a lot, right? I've I've learned a lot from um, my experience with athletes that I can help individuals. I have an individual named um, Mohammed, in which uh, he had a really bad knee injury. Right, his knee was swollen as hell, and he didn't want to come in. He said, oh, "I have to go to physio." I said, "Forget physio. Come and train with me." When I say training, I mean taking care of your body because the first thing about training with me is taking care of your body. Learn how to stretch properly. Learn how to use a roller. Learn what ice baths do. You know what I mean? You got to take care of your body more than you train your body. And when he learned that, he got over that knee injury real quick. Then he had to learn how to do cardio. No one likes cardio. But when he learned what cardio can do for the body, then he loves cardio. I have to tell him to stop shit. And now he's the strongest uh, trainee that I know. And he's in his 50s, right? He's the oldest individual I have and he's kicking everyone's ass. And he doesn't have any sports background. He has no sports background, uh, no training real background, and and he's one of the strongest individuals. So it all depends on how much you want to push yourself. His attitude is inspiring, actually. I, I can see it in his eyes that he really wants it. Mm -hmm. Shit, I posted a video of uh, that uh, treadmill thing, the last video, and he's the only one who commented right away. Man, I miss it because he's in India right now. And he's, he's always he's still there, you know what I mean? He's still there mentally. And that's what I'm talking about. When you really want something, No matter what, nothing's going to stop you. He's not even in the country. And he's still watching. Okay, what's Hank posting today? Oh, shit. I wish I was doing that right now. Funny enough, I think I'm getting addicted to uh, training. It's a good addiction to have. I have that effect on people. Like, seriously, the night before, I'm thinking, okay, I should do this training the next day. I should do that. Maybe I should try this thing. And I never had this before. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that, man. You taught me a lot of uh, soft skills during training as well. Uh, small nuggets of knowledge about mindset, intent, and confidence. I've mm -hmm. struggled and still struggle with confidence and self-esteem, to be honest. It's something that I'm working hard on. And We're all human, bro. Were you always this confident or were there moments when your self-esteem and confidence took a beating? And you know, What did you do to overcome those moments? And I'm not talking about injury. I'm talking about mental, emotional injuries that it's not, you know, it's not easily seen, but you, you feel it. Like I said, we're all human, man. Like... Uh... Life will, life, life will throw stones at you and throw pebbles at you. You know what I mean? It's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get up, right? Like drop down seven times, get up eight. It's, it's, it's all, it's, that's, that's, that's my mentality, man. Like I've been through a lot of shit in my life, a lot of shit. And that, that goes along with Golden Phoenix, not the Phoenix, you know what I mean? And that's what pushes me. I have the Phoenix like tattooed on my arm, right? It's right here. It's always remind me. And also what happened, I have pain is temporary. You know what I mean? It always remind me that everything you go through life, everything you go through in life is temporary. Everything. Nothing is forever. Funny enough, I've started uh, cold baths and, you know, the first few moments are the most uh, painful. Oh, they hurt, right? Yeah. This is actually my mantra. Pain is temporary. I, I keep uttering and I, then I submerge myself. You know what? L let it happen. And what happens when you make that sacrifice? You feel fucking good after, right? I mean, your injury recovers a lot faster. But the lack to get out, out of your legs, what I mean is like... You have heavy legs, right? You go in there, you're suffering for a few minutes. But when you get out... You feel light. Exactly. When you make sacrifice, there are always benefits. Always benefits. Sometimes you don't even realize the benefits. You have trained many young athletes and you have helped people completely transform their body and life while you're doing it with me. Mentality-wise, what are the inherited wrong ideas and thought processes do you see more in kids and people in general? And what do you do to help them unlearn them? Bad habits. Form. State of mind. Saying I can't. That you hate it. Uh, whenever uh, I say it, oh, I can't. Fail first. Don't say you can't. 
take the time to fail. Failing is learning. Saying I can't is saying I don't want to learn. I don't want to see what what it's ahead of me. I don't want to see my future. Because when you say you can't, you're not saying can't to something physical. You're saying can't to something you've never tried. And even if you tried it, try again. Does confidence need to be earned? Uh, someone who is really in the beginning of their journey and are still, let's say, rum ruminating on past mistakes and failure, this can cause some negative compound effect on their self-esteem. I'm talking from personal experience. Um, what can you do in those situations while fighting the inner negativity when you don't have that, you know, that raw evidence? You know what? I'm competent. Therefore, I'm confident. Let's say when you don't have that, you still have those negative thoughts that keeps pulling you down, pulling you down. What do you do then? Have faith, man. Have faith. You like that's why that's why I, I do what I do. That's why I don't write anything down. Just give a piece of paper to somebody. I I try to tell my clients, my my athletes, uh, people I care about that I help that when it comes to developing yourself physically and mentally, you have to have faith that you're growing. You know what I mean? Um, sometimes you don't see it right away. Sometimes you're growing and you have big, big friggin' changes and you don't realize it because you're in the moment. And then when you stop and look at it, you're like, oh shit, look at me. Individuals go on the scale, they haven't gone on the scale in a while and they see they lost the, the body fat. Individuals that have their first, I'm not gonna say who, but an individual come up to me and he said, oh shit, Hank, yo, I've been training with you for a while, man, and grabbing the bottom of his stomach saying, shit, I still have this blubber. I can't get rid of it. I'm like, bro, do you know how much weight you've lost? He's like, what are you talking about? Have you ever had abs before? No, bro, I don't have abs. I have this blubber here. I said, go in the mirror, take your shirt off, and look right here, right under your chest. I guarantee you have two abs right there. He smirked. I said, go in the bathroom. He turned around, went to washing. He stayed in there for like 10 minutes. He came back out. He's like, oh, shit. I said, that's cardio right there. <laughs> you don't want to do it, but you did it. And now you got abs. You didn't look at that because no one looks at that. Everyone just looks down. They see their chest, which hides the first set of abs. And all they see is down here. Down here is the last thing that's going to leave you. So when he saw that, he's like, oh, shit. I didn't know that was happening. Of course you didn't. You're just focusing on the negative. And that's literally how a lot of attraction. When you focus on the negative, it brings you back down. Right. He was focusing on that little flab right there. So in his mind, he was saying, I'm doing all this hard work and I'm not getting results. What happens after that? He stops working. Why? Because I'm doing all this work. I'm not getting results. I'm not going to work anymore. And then he will resort to stop training. And then he'll get all the whatever fat he had before. And then the abs will disappear. And he never had time to see them. But now because he saw those two abs, he thought not negative, but the positive part of his body. And now he adapted his mindset to shit. I did all that work and there is results. So now I'm going to work harder. So he lost more and more and more and more. Why? Because he stopped uh, focusing on the negative. Understand the concept? Good. Is it ever too late to completely transform your life, whether it's mind, body, mentality? Is there any limit, let's say age or, or anything? <sighs> Every individual is different, my friend. All right. Some people are going to be harder, harder to convince than others. Some people can be hard headed and just fuck off. My goal is to try to reach as many people as possible and try to convince as many people as possible as possible that you can always change your life, no matter how old, how young, how hard headed, no matter what injury you have, you can always push past that. All right. Uh, like I said, I, have, I had a pinched nerve. Uh, I have um, a ruptured, what is it called? When you have a pinched nerve in your spine and it's ruptured. And I, it was, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, herniated disc. I have a herniated disc in my spine and my collarbone. So my neck is. Technically, when that happened, I should have been, I should have stayed paralyzed or had nerve damage. But I don't. You know why? Why? Because I decided not to. I'm not going to sit here like a fucking vegetable and allow anyone to tell me I can't do something. So not only did I get past that, I lifted more weight than I've ever lifted in my entire life. And I don't have pain. 
your limits are what you place in front of you. One of my one of my idols right now, to be honest with you, is um David Goggins. Can't hurt me. That's the guy who wrote uh, "Can't Hurt Me." His his mentality, and I only only like this is just lately, right? Because I only learned about him actually after I joined the military. So uh, one of the sergeants came up to me and said, like, "Hey, you remind me of David Goggins because I was bald, right? I shaved my head, shaved my face uh, while I was while I was doing uh, my training." And he's like, "You remind me of David Goggins because the way I was pushing. This is before my injury." Remind me of David Goggins. And I'm like, why? He's like, you just keep on fucking pushing. Keep on going. I'm like, who's this guy? He's like, look him up. And the second, the day I looked him up, bro, it changed the, changed, it changed the way it's a lot of things, bro. I mean, military-wise, you know what I mean? And um, that's the mentality I have towards life. You know what I mean? I didn't know someone was out there with that same, like, stop being a little fucking bitch and just get up and do it. If you want to lose weight, lose weight. You want to get strong, get strong. If you have an injury, get fucking past that shit. Keep on going. If your foot hurts, keep on moving until it doesn't hurt anymore. You know what I mean? Nothing's going to, nothing, no, no one's going to give you anything. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't matter if you're poor. If you want to, if you want to uh, achieve something, you can do it. Shit. We know people that grew up in fucking slums in the ghetto and, and have over a billion dollars in their, in their bank account right now. It's about hard work. It's about dedication. It's about not giving up. By all means. By all means. Yeah. Let's say if you have to change one thing in this world, just one thing, what would it be? The cost of education. You want to become a doctor? Most people say, well, I can't afford medical school. If you went up to somebody and said, listen, I'm going to put you in school for free to become a doctor. You tell that to anybody when they're a small, like in, coming out of high school. There's no fees. You just go to school and you learn and you become a doctor. Do the years, you'll become a doctor. And you, and you have a doctor's salary. 90% or at least 80% of the people say, okay, I'm going to do it. But that 80% or 90% won't do it. Why? Because they'll say, oh, I can never afford that. You want to be um, a psychiatrist. Still, you got to pay the fees, right? You want to go to university, still university fees, but no matter what you go into. Right, a lot of people don't go through that process because they can't afford it. I would go to school, but this year I have to work. So you have to choose paying for your rent or paying for school. It's a choice, bro. But if you work, you'll never get the opportunity to learn, so you get a better job. Technically, I know some people say different about that. You know, what I mean, if you follow your passion, you don't always have to go to school, depending on what you want to be. Obviously, I haven't. But uh, what I am saying is. Certain things, people, they don't follow their dreams because of they have to work to make money to pay for other things. Or they stop school because they can't afford it anymore. Some people praise the system saying that, uh, oh, that's just how capitalism works and everything. But I'm feeling like you have a different uh, opinion about that. Say you want to be a technician, uh, an electrician, sorry. And uh, you pay for that. You could spend hours and hours on YouTube. And I'll Google and learn all that shit by yourself. But it doesn't necessarily mean you learn the right way of doing things, right? Because obviously when you take a class, they go through all the steps properly. But now imagine instead of wasting all that time going to random YouTube channels and what you could actually just go to a school that will just teach you it. So you can get a job and it will help you live to make money. You know what I mean? Instead of just spending all the money away. Or lots of people say, I, yes, I, I, I got this college degree, but uh, I paid so much money in, in school. I have so much school debt now that, yes, I got this great job, but all the money that I'm making is just paying off the debt. So it's a cycle. It's not really promoting, in my opinion, the pursuit of education for the sake of learning. It's always there is this uh, you got to spend money to make money mentality where, let's say, for example, somebody who is be going to become, let's say you talked a lot about technical field like doctor or electrician. But think about somebody who is who doesn't want to do any of that and just wants to focus on theoretical physics or really high level abstract math that's not going to be used in the next 300 years. Where's the money incentive there? So how will the world, for example, let's say tomorrow education is education becomes free, the education system becomes, you know, less of a pain. How would it change the world in your vision? 
Opportunity, bro. You give people opportunity. To become who they are? Not who they are. Who they're destined to be. Who they, who they would like to achieve in the future. Thank you for tuning in to Improve Mentor. If you found this episode valuable, share this with your friends and family members who are on a journey to grow and prosper. And please, take care of your health, physical, mental, or otherwise. Until next time.